Most Notorious contains adult themes. It is not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome, everyone, to the Most Notorious Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Rivenus. The holidays, of course, are a time for family, peace, and love. There have been moments in American history, however, when the Christmas season was not a happy time. Today, we remember a terrible tragedy that happened on Christmas Day in Germantown, North Carolina, in 1929. I'm pleased to speak with Trudy J. Smith about her book, The Meaning of Our Tears. She had an earlier edition a few years ago called White Christmas, Bloody Christmas. Ms. Smith, alongside her father, M. Bruce Jones, compiled interviews that helped document a tragic story, the Lawson family Christmas murders. Thank you, Trudy Smith, for joining me today. Could you talk about what originally piqued your interest in this story? And how did you initially hear about it? And how did you and your father team up to write the first edition of this book? Okay, thank you so much, Eric, for having me on. That's a question I get asked quite often. And it's a sort of a unique situation. My father, in 1929, he was eight years old. And when that tragedy happened, it was several miles away from him here in North Carolina. He lived in Thomasville, and he was just a small child. But that day, once that mass murder had occurred, and it was on Christmas Day, and it was a unusually cold and snowy Christmas that year, and he was just absolutely dumbfounded as a small child that a father could murder his entire family on Christmas Day. It just really captured his heart and his mind, and he wasn't alone, and I think that's part of why this story resonates with so many people. The fact that a father would do this on Christmas Day was just really huge for him and others. So he always talked about that from the time I was very small. He would bring that murder up, and it was always talked about. It was always wondered what happened, what caused him to do such a tragic thing. So, like in the early 60s when I was small, he took us up to um, where the cabin was that they lived in. It was still there at the time, and we weren't able to go in it. But even then, he was talking about it, interested in it. And um, in 1987 when he retired, and he was in his 60s then, of course, he retired and um, had some friends up in that area. And of course, they would sit around and talk about it. And he ended up being able to speak to an older gentleman that was the murderer's best friend. His name was Hill Hampton, or Hillary Hampton, as everyone called him Hill. And so that got it started. And he told me that he wanted me to come up to the mass grave. There is a little sleepy, small family graveyard, but it has this mass grave with all the people within my book are just about in that cemetery. And I was standing there, I looked at the epitaph on the tombstone. You know, you're looking at this really huge grave with all these people in it, and the tombstone says, not now, but in the coming years, it will be in a better land. We'll read the meaning of our tears, and someday we'll understand. And I remember standing there looking at it with him, and I said, you know, that almost sounds like a prophecy. Why? And I said, has no right. one in all these years ever written a book about this? And he said, no. And that's really how it kind of started. Tell us about the Lawson family prior to the tragic events on Christmas Day 1929. Well, the Lawsons were just a typical rural family tobacco farmers. Um, there were so many in our state that were tobacco farmers, and especially in that area. They come from an area called Lawsonville, 
where many of their relatives were, and they moved to this town of Germantown uh, because of the farming and the proximity to Winston-Salem, North Carolina, where they could sell tobacco. The murderer, Charlie Lawson, um, had moved to that area along with some of his kinfolk, as you would say, a couple of brothers. Prominent in the meaning by tears was his brother Marion, which was a younger brother. And so they all were living there and living cooperatively as tobacco farmers in that area. The, it was a very, very small town, Germantown was, close to another city called Walnut Cove. Well, so anyhow, they were kind of typical, just a rural family. He was very well thought of in the community. You know, his family was as religious as anyone else, um, generally until the end. And he began to, in a couple years before the Christmas tragedy there, he, he would not let ch- the children have Christmas Christmas toys and things. That, that's still somewhat of a mystery. But they were um, not a family that stood out. So when this happened, the community just really couldn't fathom it. Can you walk us through the day of the murders? Okay. Well, there were things leading up to this murder that people remembered when we interviewed them. Charlie had hit his head a few years, or maybe a year or two earlier, in uh, kind of a severe injury, and people wondered if that made him go crazy. I don't think that figured in in the book. We explored that. Uh, but anyhow, the day, really, if you start back a couple weeks before the murders, there was a wake there where he had warmed his hands over a bonfire or, you know, because the house was small and they couldn't all get in there for the wake for this lady that was a neighbor. And he was overheard saying, or they were speaking of, you know, what happens in life and the meaning of life and death. And, and during that conversation with some neighbors, he had said, I wouldn't mind dying if I could just take my family with me. And in those months and weeks before, he had complained of things, physical ailments, problems, you know, with something like a rash on his chest. And he had many headaches going on um, where he had seen a several doctors for that. So he was in mental, some in, mental anguish. And also, once you get through reading the book, you'll realize that there is a scandal that comes out, and it was hidden for like 60 years. It may have been a factor, too. But the day of the murders, they were just doing things like rural folks would do back then. Cold and snowy, they'd gone outside and were throwing up cans and shooting them and, um, you know, having fun. And everyone said that Charlie Lawson just seemed absolutely just like fine. You know, this is the morning of the murders on Christmas morning. You know, everyone leaves and the children leave and he gets out in front of them and goes and hides behind a tobacco barn, probably about 500 yards away from the little home they lived in. And he ambushed his two daughters and shot one of them with a rifle as she was coming up past him. And the other one ended up being shot with a shotgun. And it was always, for me, a a mystery as to why would you shoot one with a rifle and one with a shotgun. But... I pretty much figured out, I think he was having trouble with his rifle jamming because there was information that he had sent uh, the rifle to a local gunsmith to be worked on. He was paranoid about his guns, people said. And um, I think his gun actually jammed and he had a a shotgun with him and he shot the second victim, his second little daughter, with a shotgun, which I don't think he intended to do because that would do a great amount of damage to a seven-year-old, at least to her body. So anyhow, after doing that... He dragged the two little girls inside the tobacco barn. He posed them in death with their heads on rock that were there and crossed their arms, closed their eyes, and then he took off running to the house. When he got back to the cabin they lived in, he shot his wife as she was stepping up onto the porch with a shotgun and, you know, through the body. Originally in the first old book that I wrote, White Christmas, Bloody Christmas, I believed that he had, that she had died immediately. Um, Later... There was an eyewitness who was a little boy nine years old in the house. This is one of the things I found so amazing that it took about 75 years to find out Hmm. who that little boy was in the house that witnessed part of the murders. But anyhow, when we got his story, the wife, Fanny, was not dead. She was in agony being pulled into the house. At the same time, this little boy ran in from the back of the house, hearing all the screaming and commotion, and he saw Charlie Lawson kill the daughter, the next victim, who was shot through the body with a, a close range with a um, shotgun. Now, once he got that done inside and shot the uh, 70-year-old daughter, Marie, 
it stopped the clock. And that was always a mystery as to why did this clock stop at the time of the murders. And that was because of the, the large sound and the uh, concussion that it made inside the room. And it actually stopped the, sure. the, the clock. Right, and so it really recorded the time of the murders at 1.25 in the afternoon. So this little boy, his name was Hassel Miller. He evidently ran after looking the killer in the eyes, and uh, he never told anyone, never, ever told anyone, evidently, what he had seen. And a caregiver for him, when he was in his 80s, actually got him to talk about it for a few minutes, and he told her the story. When I first heard the story from her, she didn't even know what she was telling me because I always knew there was someone else in the house that witnessed it. It was like a rumor. We couldn't pinpoint it, really. Hmm. And there might have been three people there who never really talked about it. We're not 100% sure. But when I heard his story and what he talked about what happened when the seven-year-old daughter was shot, she had injuries that really no one knew but the people who had handled her body back then. She had broken teeth, a broken wrist, a broken neck and um, was shot through the back. And in the first book, White Christmas, Bloody Christmas, I had taken all this information and imagined that she had turned for the poker at the fireplace and was shot as she was turning because that would have been about the only thing you could see in the pictures of the room that might be a weapon she could use against him. And indeed, that's what he said happened, that she really did turn to try to go for the poker. He shot her through the back. She fell back. Well, she actually was thrown forcefully up into the... uh, fireplace mantle and you can just imagine that that would break her teeth break her neck yeah and uh, possibly break her wrist if she was in the right position to hit that mantle that hard he said it just threw her up against it and she fell back and then he looked into the killer's eyes and then what he told Renee Dudley which was the caregiver that told me the story said that he said he looked at him like if you don't get out of here you're next and he turned and ran, but she couldn't get him to tell any more about it. She said he began to shake and turned white and said that he wasn't going to talk any more about it. So that is pretty controversial in that story because I didn't know about it until 2006. Hmm. And even his family claimed it couldn't be because he never told, told them about it. So he had so much detail for what he said that it matched it that I truly believe that she, that Renee Dudley was telling the truth, and he really was a, a little nine-year-old boy who saw that inside the house that day. So that's really one of the most important interviews to me, That how amazing that he would keep that for so many years and how amazing that it would finally come out right at the same year I was working on The Many of Our Tears. Yeah, that must have felt incredible to find an eyewitness materialized so long after a crime and right as you're putting your book together. <laughs> and what's amazing is, now my father died in 2001. I was writing, rewriting the story, The Mean My Tears, in 2006 when this came out. But he had he had interviewed Hassel Miller himself. And I had notes from the interviews and things. And uh, he did not tell my father anything about that when he was interviewed for the first book. So it, to me, it was just astounding that he really was the one that saw it and never told anyone about it, hardly anyone at all except her. So back to the day of the the massacre. Charlie kills Marie, but he's not done yet. He actually continues to to search out the rest of his children. Yes, after he killed Marie, he actually killed several younger children inside the home. And he left them all posed, as he did the, the two daughters in the tobacco barn. And then, as I was writing The Meaning of Our Tears, there was another gentleman who was in the house. He was 12 years old, and he was in the house. The next morning, before they cleaned anything up, he saw a lot of things that go into the book, and it caused you to be able to say what might have been happening almost moment to moment during the murders, things like an imprint where he just sat on the bed. He could see his footprints in the blood. Um, It's so amazing that back then a murder like that could happen, and the public could just go and walk through the crime scene. And this gentleman, he really remembered a lot about it. But anyhow, after he got all, and he also killed the a three-month-old infant in its crib, his three-month-old daughter, Mary Lou. And uh, after he killed her, I project that he, she was probably last. And then he got, he was upstairs in the house, evidently getting pillows and things to go under their heads because when they found the bodies, each one had its, their own pillow under their head and posed. 
But while he was up there, evidently, well, it wasn't evidently, his brother Claude Lawson uh, had been out hunting and was coming by to say Merry Christmas to the family. And he actually found the bodies inside the house. And then when they were leaving, they could, they thought they saw a face in the upstairs window. And I believe it was Charlie. And he was up there at that time uh, finding pillows you know, put under their heads. After that, though, as Claude and his son, who were there, left uh, to go get help, then I think he came out, and then he went probably about a 1,000 yards or so out into the woods into a pine thicket. And it took him a while, but a few hours. The murders, main part of the murders happened about 1.25 that afternoon, and he killed himself more during the twilight, about 5, 5 or 6 o'clock in the evening. But by that time, there had been a whole group of neighbors and, not police, but sheriffs and everyone there wondering where he was, but everyone was too afraid to venture out very much to look for him, and then they ended up hearing a shot off in the distance, and that was when Charlie killed himself. But I always said it evidently was much easier for him to kill his family than it was to kill himself. And you write in your book that there was evidence that he'd been pacing quite a lot before taking his own life. Yeah, he evidently, it just wasn't as easy. He he had his two hunting dogs out there, Sam and Queen, and they evidently stayed with him. And um, just lots of little details, like he had struck matches, and that type of thing, maybe to warm his hand. You know, it took him probably three or four hours to, I guess, to get the nerve to kill himself. And then they found his body, and oh, there's just so much detail that we found out from here and there, from letters coming in after the first book was written. Um, someone stole one of the guns that was used that was there when they brought the, his body back to the house and um, to kept it. And then someone wrote us a letter about it in 1990, I think it was 1992. So it's just lots and lots of details. And I think the amazing thing is one person or even a handful of people couldn't recreate the story. But when you get all the little pieces from every person and many of these people are now deceased that we interviewed. You take each one of them, small story, and you weave it together, and you have a picture of this murder that's almost, for a good part of it, moment to moment. You can almost figure out what he was doing from the time it started to the time it ended. I wanted to ask you about his oldest son, too. He was the only one of the children who actually survived. Is that correct? Well, yes, and that's something that happened that day. If you back up into the story, you know, at the very beginning when they were shooting, and, you know, they get up early in the country back in those days to go hunting. They were actually hunting for food, you know, rabbits, whatever. And many of them that Christmas morning were rabbit hunting. And uh, his son, Arthur, and his it's his cousin, Sam, Sanders, Sanders had stayed overnight that night on that Christmas Eve with them. And... There's been a lot of theories as to why this went down like it did. Charlie Lawson killed every single member of his family except his son, Arthur, who was later called Buck. That morning, they had asked him could they borrow some more shells right, you know, right before the murders because they wanted to go back out hunting some more. And he kind of sent them away saying, you know, he didn't have any more shells. You know, but pick him up some too. And at that time, back in the in that era... The little small towns around, a lot of people lived in the, above their stores and things. And you could go even on a holiday and knock on the door and probably somebody coming down and sell you something. And that's pretty much what happened. So Sanders Lawson and Arthur, the murderer's son, um, he kind of sent them on their way. And my theory, is, if, if you read in the book, is that Arthur and he had already been at, at odds. And he had already been doing some threatening of the family. And... Evidently, um, my theory is that he felt the two of those big strapping boys might stop him what he wanted to do. And he may have made the decision just to let them go on. And then you might say, well, maybe he thinks Arthur is going to carry his seed on or his legacy, and, which he did. Uh, Arthur ended up with uh, uh, grandchildren and possibly by now maybe even grand- great-grandchildren in the uh, California area. And um, But anyhow, it was always a mystery to everybody. Why would he let that one son get away? And we don't truly know, but, you know, you read the book, that's my theory. One of the primary questions people have about Charlie Lawson is motive. What were some of the rumored motives 
that you heard as you began your research, and what did you eventually conclude? Okay. Well, I'll take you back to our beginning again, right after we're standing in that graveyard and talking about, well, has anybody ever written a book about this? And my father said, no. And I said, well, why? He said, because they would threaten to kill you. And I said, what? And he said, yeah, they would threaten to kill you. Anybody that said that they were going to write a book or do anything about it. And I said, well, you know, it's been six, at that point in 1990, or 1987 or so. I said, it's been almost 60 years. Surely nobody will say anything. Well, I was wrong. They were still willing to kill you. Wow. <laughs> uh, we got death threats and everything else when, when we put out the first book. And the reason why is when he first started, and he didn't know any of this when he first started interviewing people. But pretty soon, he, this rumor started creeping in, and he came to me. The way we did that first book, I was working, had a family, all that. And I said, well, you know, if you'll do the research, then I'll write it as a book. And if we can get it done, it'll be done. You know, it'll be like, if it's meant to be, it'll, it'll be. But he started bringing me back information, and we talked to people and got some pictures and things. But this rumor kept creeping in with people saying they thought the eldest daughter, Marie, was pregnant by her father. I said, surely that's just some kind of crazy rumor. So I started out thinking, well, you know, we'll just disprove that. Surely it's not that. It, that didn't turn out to be, though. There was just too many things kept coming up. And then later, after, and, and I didn't know, we didn't know for sure. We couldn't really say for sure, even though his niece, who figures prominently in, especially in The Meaning of Our Tears, her life story does. For the first book, she finally came forward and, and told that that daughter was pregnant by her father, Charlie Lawson. And we put that in the first book, and of course that started a wildfire of controversy. But anyhow, in 1992, after that book had been out two years, um, my father had an opportunity through Stella Lawson and one of her childhood friends to interview this lady, and her name was Ella Mae Johnson. I don't give her married name because I don't want her family bugged. But um, Ellen A. Johnson spent the night with Marie Lawson two weeks before the murders, and Marie actually broke down, cried, and told her about the fact that she felt she was pregnant by her father. So at that time, Ellen A. Johnson was in a nursing home, fairly elderly. But she, she told my father that, indeed, Marie Lawson herself had told her that. This was two years after the first book came out. So I had a lot of this information for years. Writing that first book took a toll on me. Everything that went down with trying to do it, do it by myself, you know, deal with everything that went on and the threats and the controversy. There was a long time I said, I'm just not dealing with this anymore. I'm not going to rewrite it. And my father always wanted it, the I meaning by tears, to be done, you know, the, the enlarged version. And he died in 2001, and it took me till 2006 to sit down and write The Meaning of Our Tears and put it out again and put all this new information together. But that that's a controversy. There's still people who don't believe it. They, don't, they think we've made it up or it's a bad rumor that didn't happen. But I just say you just read everything that we got from everybody and everybody's story and pretty much just come to your own conclusion, was it true or not. To this day, I can't tell you absolute 100% that it was. I can only tell you what people told us, and, right. and that's the way I wrote it. Hello all, Eric here. So if you are not a big fan of advertisements disrupting the flow of an interview, <laughs> there is an option. Go to patreon.com slash most notorious, and for just $2 a month, get all my episodes ad-free. This will not only be for the Most Notorious podcast, but also for my new podcast debuting in September of 2018 called Where Blood Runs Cold, a collection of terrifying historical true crime stories from my home state, Minnesota. And for $4 a month, you'll not only get the ad-free episodes, but bonus content as well, including extra episodes, special commentary, and more. So skip the ads, support the show, and listen to new stuff by going to patreon.com slash most notorious. That's patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash most notorious. See you there. Cheers. Now back to the interview. You were fortunate enough to be able to talk to some of the friends and family members of the Lawsons in your research, as you've mentioned. Was there a particular interview that struck you as especially 
poignant or powerful? Each and every one of them has its place in the story, and you probably have gaps without it. So it's hard to say one above the other. I have to say I value Stella Lawson, the the murderer's niece. Probably value her input the most of anyone because she had a lot to lose. And it was very controversial for her and her family because the family, many of them knew this about the the incest. They evidently had made a pact the day of the murder or, or that evening, called the family together and made a pact that no one would ever talk about it. And that evening she had heard some about it. But, you know, by overhearing the talk, they sent all the children out and only the adults stayed in that home where they met. And and I can understand why they would not, you know, especially when it's right there upon you that it's live, it's like then that you wouldn't want that scandal mm-hmm. uh, to go forward. But she gave us so much information and was so cooperative. And, you know, she some of her family wouldn't speak to her for several years because she had told what she did for the first book, White Christmas, Bloody Christmas. So I really value her a lot. She died in 1994, uh, four years after the first book. I have to ask you about the family picture taken just days before they were killed. And it's really unnerving, I have to say. And I found myself staring at their faces, you know, almost trying to read the expressions, get a hint about what they're feeling, especially Marie's, because she's standing shoulder to shoulder with her father, Charlie, who she might have had this, you know, incestuous relationship with. And he appears slightly agitated to me. Am I reading too much into this picture? And I'm going to put the photo on my website. It's mostnotorious.com, so everyone can take a look at it for themselves. At right after the murders, there were so many hundreds of people coming that they set the house up as a tourist attraction and because they couldn't keep people from coming onto the property, tearing things up, stealing things, whatever, because of the notoriety of the murder. And at the house, they sold these pictures. And that there was five pictures. What actually started out as six pictures. One of them was the guns, and that was so controversial, it was immediately taken out of the packet that was sold at the house. So those are extremely rare to find a real one. Uh, it took my father probably five or six years to find one of them. But that picture was sold. And when you see the picture that off of the original negative that was sold at the house, it's so clear. You can see the stubble on Charlie Lawson's beard. You can see the threads in the uh, lace on their dresses. And you can really see into their eyes and see their expressions. And I had access to that. And we made some four by five negatives of those original pictures. So it's just amazing to see the detail in those pictures. And you can really look at their expressions, look into their eyes. You can almost see their eyelashes. Those old pictures are so clear. And, um, yeah, it's really haunting. You see how they're leaning or not leaning toward each other or their hands touching. It's really something. And another thing I thought was unusual, and I'm sure there must be pictures out there, but in all these years, I have never found another picture of any of these people except that portrait that he took or had taken two weeks before the murder. And he was obviously recording them because he knew what he was going to do and that he knew that people would probably want to see his beautiful family he took with him. So, yeah, that picture, I don't think you're reading too much. I think there's a lot that you can see in it. and um. It's very haunting to me. You mentioned just now how the remaining family members turned the house into a tourist attraction and the family Christmas cake was even on display for a while. Right. The day of the murder, she had been baking a cake and she had just gotten it finished, evidently. It was a raisin cake with raisins dotted all over it. And um, that house... They actually had that thing open literally almost within a week of the murders for people to tour it. And I've talked to some people who saw it. Of course, if you're talking to them in in this time and day and time, they're elderly now, and so their memories are from when they were small children. But there are still some people who have walked through it, you know, as a tourist attraction, or they're still alive. Now, they had it roped off where you could walk through it, and as you walk past the dinner table with the Dish is not yet cleared away and that cake there. And um, people would walk past it, but they were picking the raisins off the cake as souvenirs. And believe it or not, 
for White Christmas, Bloody Christmas, when I was doing the my little author tour that I did back then, at a book signing, I had someone come up and tell me they had Fanny's blood and one of the raisins in a jar. Oh. And that tells you the, the type of mindset people had to collect anything that they could. They would pick up rocks. They would dig up trees. They took pieces of the home. And people really criticized Marion, the murderer's brother, for doing that, you know, for setting it up as a tourist attraction. But in the book, I explained once I interviewed Stella and got all this information, he had to do something. That was a 100-acre farm, and the only person left was the devastated 16-year-old son that was left. He was not going to be able to farm it. He wasn't old enough. He had just lost his entire family. You had these people overrunning it, and Marion had to do something. He had to pay for the farm for the boy, and he had to stop people from coming in and, and just wrecking the place. And so they made the decision really quickly to set it up, fence it off, and charge people admission. And that's what they did, and they did it from the time of the murder to maybe about 1934, I think. And uh, they said there'd be, you know, there's a bottom field there. It was like a cornfield or, or a, a hay field at times. And they said there would be hundreds of cars there sometimes on Sunday afternoons to go through the place. Well, that, and, of course, that... one of the most famous ones, of course, was uh, there's a the story of John Dillinger showed up. And that's something that, you know, as much as written about John Dillinger, people don't realize that he stopped there at that house uh, on his way to Florida on one of his last trips down, you know, before he was killed. And speaking of John Dillinger, this fascination during this time of taking souvenirs from a crime scene, what didn't just happen in North Carolina, of course, it was all over the place. After Dillinger is gunned down by Melvin Purvis, Outside the Biograph Theater in Chicago, people actually dipped handkerchiefs, bits of newspaper, whatever they could find in the blood, the fresh blood, I mean, still pooled on the sidewalk. Um, Just unbelievable, the things that they were doing. But, you know, once I really looked into it, I had always wondered, why would he set that up to make money off of a murder in his family? But it was like he pretty much had to do it. And uh, because people had that mindset of scraping up the blood, um, anything they could possibly do. The day of the murders, while the son, Arthur, was there, and it it just happened, they just brought him back. It was one person offering $500 if the sheriff would let him him go in the house and see the body. I don't know what the the morbid fascination in that era was, but it really was there. Now, this episode is being released just before Christmas, and in the spirit of the holidays, what good do you believe came from your researching and writing these books? That's an interesting question. In many ways, I'm documenting what happened, and I've tried to do it in the most truthful way possible. It just so happens that he chose, for whatever reason, to do this on this holiday. As far as the value of it, I really think if I look into what can go wrong in a family, you know, it's a myriad of things, I think, that went on with him that caused him to do what he did. I still can't tell you in my own mind why he felt Christmas unless he just really wanted it to be remembered, which it has been. I mean, if that was his goal, that certainly worked. The connection with the Chris- being done on Christmas Day really set it in people's minds and hearts. And I don't know... If I can say my writing the book, you know, has anything more to do, I might would have still written it if it hadn't been Christmas, but I, I really do think that the fact that he would do that to his small children and everything on Christmas Day caused everyone to remember it. I don't know if that's a good answer or not. Thank you, Trudy Smith, for your time today. Well, you're quite welcome. Thank you for having me on. Trudy Smith is printing a limited hardcover edition of her original White Christmas, Bloody Christmas, in honor of the 25th anniversary of its original release. And in the meantime, you can get a copy of her expanded version, The Meaning of Our Tears, directly from her website at themeaningofourtears.com. This is Eric Rivenus with The Most Notorious Podcast. I appreciate you spending part of your holidays with me, and I wish you a Merry Christmas and the happiest of holidays.
This is Peter on his motorcycle. Oh, the open road! And this is Peter off his motorcycle. Um, please move your paper off my desk. Thank you. On his motorcycle. I feel so alive! Off his motorcycle. I feel like we covered that already, so... On. Wow! Look at the ocean! Off. Look at this article I found about urban planning. You're better on your bike. Progressive helps keep you on it. Get a quote in as little as three minutes at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates.